Hi, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Thank you for being here. Uh, welcome to Mayor's Principles and Accessibility. We have an exciting little book chat for you today. This is our first book chat that we're doing in our second live event. Um, if you are joining us, you should be watching us on YouTube Live. So feel free to use the chat if you have any questions, comments, or you want to direct it at a specific person on the screen, feel free to include that. Um, and also know that uh, YouTube captioning should be available. Um, and uh, we're going to start out by introducing ourselves. Um, my team will introduce everyone and then we'll also I'll, I'll do a little introduction for our special guests. So uh, I'm Cecile, and my pronouns are she, her. I'm an Asian woman uh, with dark, long, dark hair, and I'm wearing a white uh, tank top today. And um, all right, I'll let I'll let y'all introduce yourselves. My name is Shaka. Give me one second to move to a larger screen. I swear I know what I'm doing. I'm managing the stream today, so I have a lot on my plate, but I, I will figure this out, I promise. There we go. My name is Shaka. My pronouns are he, him. I am an African-American male with a bit of hair on my chin, uh, and I keep it close, closely cropped all over, so pretty short hair. I'm wearing a very light blue, looks white in this, uh, in this stream shirt, and I'm wearing my most comfortable noise-canceling headphones that I love. Who's next? Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Dana Chung. My pronouns are she, her. I'm an instructional designer at Qualtrics, and I am a young woman um, with dark black hair um, and a yellow shirt. Um, hi, I'm everyone. Oh, yep. Uh, my name is Georgette. I am um, a Middle Eastern woman. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm an education specialist in K-12 education. I'm Hi. also wearing, sorry, Courtney, I'm wearing a black shirt and I have uh, long brown hair and I'm wearing glasses today. Hi, I'm Courtney. Uh, I'm an instructional designer at Brigham Young University. Uh, I'm a white woman in my mid twenties and I have curly brown hair. Um, and my pronouns are she, her. Hi, I'm Rachel. Um, I am the um, Accessibility and Inclusion Specialist at Space Center Houston. Um, I am a white woman with my brown hair pulled back. Um, I have some cool earrings on um, and a black top and a black sweater. And just to provide a little bit background, Rachel is our one of our two very special guests today. <laughs> I don't think we'd be able to do this event without her. She is definitely the expert on accessibility and we are uh, all learning from her. And so we'll have a great opportunity to do that today. Rachel has over 10 years of experience in museums and over 15 years of experience in accessibility specifically. Uh, her master's is in nonprofit management and special education focused on non-traditional settings, which are like museums, the Space Center, such. And uh, she was published in one of the most prestigious museum journals, Curator on Museum Accessibility. She's created sensory bags used at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Um, and uh, she likes to also <laughs> Uh, volunteer for organizations such as e Easter Seals and the very special arts through the Kennedy Center. So that's a little bit on Rachel. <laughs> Thank you for joining us here. I'll introduce Mark and then I'll let him uh, describe himself. Let me just move over here. All right. Okay. Mark, if you want to con come on up, thank you. Mark Hodson, he has over 10 years of experience as an instructional designer. He's worked in higher education, government, business learning and development departments. He currently works for a large health insurance company. I'm sure you've heard of it in South Carolina. He specializes in making technical training for information technology professionals. Um, and he also has the ATD uh, Associated Association for Talent and Development certified certificate from all right. He has the Master Instructional Designer Certificate from ATD. And he recently completed his master's in AI and machine learning from Colorado State University and is open to opportunities where he can apply uh, his new skill set with instructional design. So 
uh, Hey Space Center Houston, Shotgun Rachel. <laughs> uh, I'll let him introduce himself now. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Mark Hudson. I'm a white middle-aged male with brown hair, a uh, small goatee, and some uh, Sony headphones on. And I'm calling from my, my home studio office. Awesome. Great. I think we've got through all of the introductions. Yes, we did. And uh, just to provide a little context for what uh, inspired our very informal book chat with y'all today, um, as you if you've been following us, you know, we've done a lot of different posters and carousels that Dana and Georgette especially have created on Mayer's principles. Uh, these are research based principles that he has been working on for, I want to say, over 30 years. Um, and therefore, how we can optimize learning, essentially. And they should help inform how we design our learning. However, there's also been some controversies when we have posted our mayor polls about whether or not they account for accessibility. And so we're kind of going to dive into what, uh, what the principles mean, what are the boundary conditions, how they should be interpreted, and then we'll have Rachel here also to let us know how we can also account uh, and accommodate for accessibility. Um, so without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Georgette Eldorazi will be giving us a recap of our first two principles. Um, I'll let you take it away. Thanks, Cecile. Okay, so the first principle that we're going to be talking about today is principle three, which is the redundancy principle. The redundancy principle states that people do not learn better when printed text is added to graphics and narration. People learn better from graphics and narration than from graphics, narration, and printed text, especially when the lesson is fast paced. So this principle talks about um, the different components that are um, on a screen when a learner has a, like a visual setting. So for example, if um, a video is playing and there's animation and there's narration and there's on-screen text, uh, there are too many visuals for the learner to take in and this takes away from the main focus uh, of the learning content, which would be the animation and the narration itself. Um, the on-screen text would be redundant because they would be or the words that are on the screen would be exactly what's being narrated. So the learners would have limited capacity to process all of these visuals on the screen. Um, what we could do to make learning accessible is to provide um, the optional feature of um, captions. So by adding uh, captions, this gives the option for learners who need it. Uh, one thing to note, uh, the boundary condition of the redundancy principle is that the redundancy principle may be less applicable when captions are shortened. So when there are like a few words or something specific is uh, being placed on the screen, a specific word or phrase, or when learners are unfamiliar with the learn with the words in the lesson. So maybe um, this the the language being spoken isn't the learner's first language, so they would need. Um, words for additional support, or when there are no graphics, and so then learners would have to heavily depend on the um, the words being spoken, and in this way, the text would also provide uh, supporting material. Um, one of the um, the other principles that is closely linked to the redundancy principle is principle eight, the modality principle. So the modality principle states that people learn more deeply from pictures and spoken words than from pictures and spoken words. So in principle three, in the redundancy principle, we're talking about um, animation, we're talking about on-screen text, and we're talking about narration. In the modality principle, they're being compared. So we're comparing pictures and narration or pictures and on-screen text. So um, to deliver a learning experience, narrated animation should just be presented. And to, uh, to be able to um, apply the modality principle, uh, the text should not be there. It should just, 
uh, just be um, the narration itself. So in a, in a learning experience where the presentation is instruction or the instructional material is fast paced, this is fine or the modality principle would apply because um, because the content would be in a learner's first language so they would already understand what's being presented and so therefore the content wouldn't be too complex for them to understand and they could follow along um, easily. I'm going to pass this on now to Dana so she can start moderating the questions. Yeah, thanks, Sir Jet. Um, again, I'm Dana. Um, I'll be acting as the moderator for this discussion with our panelists. So just kind of as an FYI, um, panelists, it's just going to be like a discussion and you can kind of jump to this top row where I am um, if you have something you'd like to contribute. But just to kick us off, um, the question is, what do you think it looks like to address these ideas while also being inclusive? Uh, so it's a lot of information <laughs> um, to start. Um, so I just will kick it off with the, um, the concept of uh, captions. Um, it's not as simple as on or off. Um, there are considerations like closed captions versus open captions. Um, so depending on the setting of the learning, um, for example, in a museum, um, if you have one type of um, uh, projection system or, or viewing you know, system like a TV versus a theater um, that can determine what kind of captioning you use. Your audience can determine what kind of captioning you use. Um, and one tip um, with some of that is if you have the resources um, and depending on your audience, again, you can have individual tablets or iPads for students that might need them. Um, this not only creates you'll hear a lot of multiple modes of access. Um, so, and Shaka's taking his head, we do this um, a lot at the Space Center in our programming. Um, this allows for different ways to be accessible. So not only can that help with captioning options, this can help with um, audio. So you can plug in headphones and a student can, can use audio features. Um, so uh, th this kind of, I feel like addresses you know, giving options for how to receive the information. And you also want to be prepared that sometimes too many options can be overwhelming for some students. So um, that can be kind of a whole nother conversation, <laughs> but I'll just kick off the discussion with that. Mark, I moved you up in line because I was going to actually say something similar to Rachel. So you can go ahead. Okay. All right. I would uh, like to add that I think this is an area where e-learning particularly shines. So in almost all like modern e-learning designs, we give the learner as much control as possible. Um, if you compare that to like a classroom experience where the instructor can't stop for every individual, um, that's something that um, e-learning does really well at, as well as being able to turn on and off the captions. Um, and as far as inclusivity, I guess the other thing to add in there is just test your stuff. Like that's what I've gone through with my material is just actually install the JAWS screen reader, run through it and see how it works. Sometimes you'll find stuff that you didn't know and you'll always gain some more insight by getting in the learner's shoes. I actually wanted to like sort of raise a question to everybody that's sort of related. Um, we're thinking about this in terms of how people learn, but I guess the the place that I always think of when I'm thinking about this is a theater environment. Um, and so I was gonna just open it up to a broader discussion about how we live our lives because the, the goal of accessibility is that everyone should feel like they belong in a space. And so when I walk into a theater, I definitely feel like I belong because I have solid vision, solid hearing, Oh, and I'm shocked again, by the way, I'm supposed to, I'm going to try to reintroduce myself so that, and at least until I've spoken a few times so that my voice is, uh, is known. But so when I walk into a theater, I do feel at home, but I have had many friends that feel like there's not enough ability to, I have friends with, uh, 
either that are either deaf or hard of hearing. And when they walk into a theater, they are, the first thing they say is they want captions always. And what's interesting about the redundancy principle is that if captions were always on for everyone, it actually might be too much information for some. So it adds a, another layer that makes it harder for people to connect uh, because you have three sources of information. You have visual, or, well, you've got the, the movie on the screen, you've got the audio that's playing, and you've got words. And this is an issue for me. I get very easily distracted and I feel like I miss things when I have all three of those. But the idea that you can have behind the seats in the row in front of you a screen that is permanently there that starts off with captions on that you can turn off if you don't want them and your experience can be what exactly what you want it, I feel like that should be something that is talked about in every environment. Um, I'll jump in real fast. And in a, Shaka, I think you brought up a, a, a great point. And I just want to also rewind and, and make sure we're also having similar, we don't have to have the exact same definitions of access versus inclusion too. Um, so for me personally, and um, in my profession, I boil it down to access is the ability to get through the door and inclusion is the sense of belonging. Um, so just as more context, I think for people, um, you can have accessibility and not have inclusion. Um, they, they aren't mutually exclusive, you know, they don't, one doesn't um, automatically make the other one uh, a positive, if you will. Um, so I think it's just something to consider um, going forward. Um, and I just did want to um, bounce off of what Shaka said as far as um, potentially having too many modes of, of, of access, if you will. Um, we also, part of the part of the thought process behind having captions default on is that you want to avoid situations where somebody has to disclose their disability. Um, so if captions are not off or not on and somebody needs them, they would have to inadvertently disclose their disability and ask for captions um, that they may not be comfortable doing. One great suggestion I got actually from somebody else was depending on what like Straka said like the venue is um you could also schedule and put on schedules what what showings have captions what showings don't have captions um depending on what flexibility you have so for example I worked at a uh, at the Eugene Science Center where we in Oregon where we did a sensory program and we had a planetarium and so every other planetarium show was one was a low sensory planetarium show and one was kind of a regular planetarium show and we were able to offset and also say like this is what you're you can expect um so that's just kind of one tip um that i wanted to add to that And I think um, kind of building off of what Rachel is talking about, where there are situations where we want captions to be the default because we want it to be not only accessible, but ex accessible, but also inclusive. Um, there are ways to make captions better that still kind of address these ideas of cognitive load because the foundation of the principle is about this idea that we don't want um, learners to be overburdened with um, extra cognitive processes. So having the captions be um, shorter, not, not, not that they have fewer words, but that if you were captioning what I'm saying now, you wouldn't put an entire paragraph. You would put a little bit at a time and it would be moving along kind of at a talking pace or having punctuation, things that make it inherently easier to read for everyone makes it more universally inclusive um, so that you can make it the default without reducing learning as much as if the captions were bad and bad captions are bad for everyone so the better we can make them the more um the the less there will be a a reduction in learning if we're talking about a learning environment and just to uh add a little bit more to uh, what Courtney was saying, kind of what it's based off of the redundancy principle and the modal modality principle. Um, and I may butcher this name, but it's Baddeley's model of working memory. 
basically says that we have two different, or it's also referred to as like the dual channel processing hypothesis. Uh, and it basically says that we have one, one loop for po uh, processing like um, a phonological loop. So that would be like words, um, verbal, <laughs> words, text, stuff like that. And we have a different um, auditory processing channel. So it's saying that we have two channels. So the redundancy principle and the modality principle are based off of this idea that uh, both of these channels are very limited. And so if we just do narration and animation, like in the modality principle, uh, then we are, we're kind of splitting the cognitive load on both of the channels. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I was going to ask Rachel, sorry, I didn't read Courtney's thing. It was a little fast. Uh, I was going to ask Rachel, um, so knowing that for learners who have this is the boundary condition for learners who can see and hear, um, mm -hmm. so this doesn't address people who cannot, uh, it's, it's basically pointing to like, if we show like a educational video, we should start with the subtitles off by default. Do you see kind of a problem with that? Or does it depend on how large the audience is, whether or not we know there are other needs or sh do we always act as if like, do we always do universal design regardless of the number of learners and how much information we have about them? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and again, I, I will always say, obviously, I mean, this is pretty obvious, but I will always disclaim, I am not the all knower of all things accessibility, but in my, um, in my uh, professional opinion, um, the whole point of universal design is that everything is inherently accessible. So we shouldn't have to worry about, um, I'm gonna say, screaming who comes through each door, right? So, um, and and have to potentially have all these different accommodations. Things should be as inherently accessible as possible right off the get-go. And that eliminates these extra steps, if you will. So by having captions automatically on, depending on whether they're burned in or not, um, it can be helpful again it's a gray area there's not one right answer because of all these other factors like technology but um the idea is that someone then doesn't have to ask them to be turned on um there's never going to be a 100 percent right way because like somebody said you know somebody might be distracted by captions um and that might not be helpful for them so that's why it is such a personal thing as well and why organizations do need to speak to people and, and find out what they need. And Shaka mentioned personal captioning devices are also a great option. Um, there's various kinds that I've seen used in the museum world that I have preferences on um, myself, but um, I, I think universal design is what we should all strive for um and get as close to as possible obviously with the ada there's certain building um requirements that um some you know depending on new construction versus old construction and things like that that can't be changed so um things all these things are to be considered um and you know i, I does that kind of answer the question i would say yes all right I wanted to to just circle back to something Courtney said about having shorter phrases on at one time when you're looking at captioning. For me, I find that more difficult to to parse out. I said, I suppose is what I'm is I how I'm feeling about it. Yeah. People... I, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I just like if if it's a larger block, it changes less frequently, so I spend less time focusing on it. So the, the, the communities that need captioning, I'll just add this and then I know um, we can move on to another question, <laughs> other topics. Um, but um, my kind of response to that is that the communities that need captioning, they know when captioning isn't accurate. They're not, you know, for, for la lack of a better term, they're not, you know, 
unintelligent, <laughs> right? So, you know, when, when places try to have captioning that isn't actually accurate to what is being said, it's not only then inact it's inaccurate it's unfair to those that need the captioning um so there is a there can be a right way to do it or there can be a right way to do audio descriptions or um, describing what music is playing and that kind of thing um but i would say if you're as far as captioning it needs to be the script it needs to be what's actually being said and that's why live captioning is really great because it's just captioning literally what's happening at that moment yeah, and to, sorry, this is Courtney again, to clarify what I meant, Chaka and Rachel. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I work a lot with um, e-learning, right? It's mm -hmm. all online learning. And part of what we do with all of our courses is that if there is a video, we always include captions and a transcript. Oh, good. Um, and when you're looking at the captions with the things that we use, the technology that we use to make the captions, um, it might feel like the the phrases that it's coming up with automatically seem kind of short. Hmm. Um, it will stop maybe mid sentence at a comma and then it will move to a separate <laughs> section and start at a new section. Mm -hmm. um, and part of the reason that that is occurring is that our professors will talk for a really long time and yeah. their sentence will be two minutes long and you don't want a whole paragraph at the bottom of the screen. So what I'm referring to is like a couple of seconds of text mm. at a time yeah. and then the next set of text will come. Right. It should definitely be accurate, especially down to punctuation <laughs> and spelling. Yeah. If you're talking about terms that students need to know what they mean, like in my humanities courses, they need to know how to spell, mm -hmm. um, you know, the victory nom steel or whatever. Um, you want to make sure it's all accurate, but shorter phrases would help. I think I'm not the expert here, but I feel like the shorter phrases at a time mm -hmm. help ensure that students are seeing like they have time to read it all first and they also have like the time to process the words that are important like yeah. those important key vocabulary terms yeah if you if it's a script and a pre-recorded um a video of some kind like a movie sometimes having predictive captioning is helpful like you said like it's kind of giving you text and captioning before it's being actually said um then there's the live captioning which is kind of the quick and then there's kind of captioning you also see in you know museum videos like in the theater that are kind of that like two second um situation so uh, it's, yeah it's, it's a there's a lot of options <laughs> and when when you're using technologies like otter ai or if you're using panopto to come up with the captions for your video mm -hmm. sometimes i think personally for me i have a tendency to want to combine sections because i'm like oh this isn't going to look good but i want to trust that the technology knows what it's doing too and then watch it and see did the phrase length that they came up with did they did they last long enough to see what was being said were they too condensed things like that so I just want to let y'all know we do have some comments in the chat. Um, and I think, <laughs> not to totally put you on the spot, but I think Georgette or Courtney may be able to address some of these. Uh, the first one is from Melanie Knight. She says, I find it interesting that Mayor doesn't even mention accessibility in terms of uh, disabilities, only in terms of speakers of additional languages. Um, and she also says, I think learning preferences are also relevant here. Even as a person who is able to hear, I prefer to read information uh, rather than to listen. And so I often use a transcript instead of a video. Sorry, maybe I should stop there and then I'll, I'll read Kristen's, um, Kristen's messages. But if uh, anyone, uh, Courtney or Georgette also want to respond to that, um, or Shaka, because he's here. Feel free. <laughs> yeah, I popped my head in. Um, has anyone read? So I'm I'm uh, taking a, a educational technology course right now. Um, or well, I'm the master's program. Excuse me. And when we were asked about learning uh, learning preferences, I like looked up to see because we all like I feel like I'm a hands-on learner. Everybody has their style that they prefer. Uh, but that I, I read that it doesn't actually have any impact necessarily on retention. What works best is yep. having yep. Uh, the two modes uh, that work together in tandem to, to actually bring you the information. So are we now just going to like have a little section on debunking learning preferences? Because <laughs> I'm okay with that. 
I don't think maybe <laughs> we shouldn't dive too far deep into that, but yeah, it, it's a pretty accepted consensus now in higher education uh, that learning styles are not really a thing. They do not help learning. Uh, we, we do all have preferences and they can affect motivation a little bit, uh, but we won't go into that, but uh, I would confidently say that learning styles have been debunked. Yeah, I think that's uh, true in the corporate training world as well. Um, we've, I've seen uh, designers pretty well move away from that. Um, and I guess I, would, I just wanted to add um, a thought about the mayor's book on the chapters talking about uh, modality and um, the research and it's research done on t neurotypical people. <laughs> so I, I wish we could kind of like pull that out and say, well, what about people with dyslexia? What about people with autism? What about, can we do some studies on that? Um, because a lot of times I feel like, and this is just a sense that the outliers in the data are probably those people who aren't typical and, um, uh, yeah, so definitely something that we could uncover in the future, maybe. Um, and just kind of talking about that, too, uh, this is Courtney again. Um, I, while we were talking just now, I kind of looked it up because I was curious. And um, this isn't an excuse for not talking about accessibility in the book, but I don't think the conversation was happening when this book was written. The WCAG the WCAG principles didn't come out until 1999 and this book was written before that. So I think this is why these conversations now are important. We have more of an understanding of, you know, universal design and how important it is and what solutions exist. And we should be talking about combining these principles of cognitive processing with these ideas of, you know, being universally inclusive and accessible. I will say, though, with the thing that Melanie was saying about transcripts, um, when we, for, for all the courses that we create, um, when we create transcripts for our videos, we're not just doing it for students who are hard of hearing or deaf or for students who are learning a second language. We're also doing it because of technology limitations. Um, your internet in rural Idaho is not necessarily going to be sufficient to watch all of the videos in your course. So there are a lot of reasons why it's important to include these op these options. Um, and so preferences may not be just for, you know, learning preferences, but also I'm at work right now or I'm on the bus. And so I would prefer to be able to read this as opposed to listen to it. Um, so I guess that pushing back on that idea of learning preferences not actually being applicable. There are times when what you prefer really is what matters. Otherwise, you're just not going to learn at all. And just to clarify a little bit on the modality principle, um, I, I see, you know, Melanie has said she prefers to read some of the text versus uh, listening to narration. I think a lot of people are on that boat as well. So in that specific principle, um, he's comparing narration and animation and then on screen text, um, which would be equivalent to the narration. So in that particular research, uh, the research for that principle, um, it's not comparing like, say, if you had like a book with with all the text where you can easily look back on it. So there so it is very valid. And if you're reading like a transcript on a web page, that would be very different than than the way it's uh, presented in the research, which, you know, probably wouldn't be very pleasant to read a lot of text just like moving on the script. So just to throw that in there. And he is still conducting a lot of research, uh, but it's a great point. Um, and we haven't found where he specifically addresses it, not to say that he hasn't, uh, but we haven't found it. Uh, and I was gonna mention this a little bit later, but we do have an interview, elearningdesigners.org. We'll be interviewing Mayer in November. We have it on the books and uh, it's definitely at the top of the list of questions we wanna ask him about. Um, and with that, uh, sorry, my brain just went completely blank. Um, okay, we were talking about the modality principle, right? Cecile mentioned the modality principle. Um, one of the things that I love about what it talks about in the modality principle is it goes into depth about having learners be able to control the pace of what they are watching and how when learners can control the pace, 
there is almost no difference between having narration and having written text. So when we're talking about ways to make universally inclusive ways to make this accessible, um, if we allow learners, especially in e-learning or in like corporate training where someone's probably doing these learning tutorials on their own um, as an individual, when we give them the opportunity to control the pace of their videos, or if we break up a video into short sections that they can watch the section and then watch it again, um, that makes it better for everyone. And that makes it so that we can have that text options um, and it's not, it's not gonna be harmful to learning. The segmenting principle. It's my favorite. <laughs> I'm still new to this. I literally came in here as a tech guy and I'm still learning a, a lot of what's going on. The question that I have, and I wonder if it's addressed at all in any of Mayor's principles is like, if there aren't graphics and we're just talking about an audiobook and reading, is there any research done about that? Like, does it, because it's still two different uh, cognitive areas of your brain, right? It's one that is visual and one that is auditory. Is there any research on that yet? To, just to clarify, are you saying comparing an audiobook to reading or reading while listening to an audiobook? Reading while listening. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Well, can you clarify it? I'm sorry. Yeah, reading while wondering. listening. So you, uh, where you can still control the pace, but you get it in two ways. So that would read, that would, that would uh, violate the redundancy principle if you're reading it while you're listening. But there's it. no graphics. No, unless you're saying, no what, are you saying fewer words? Nope. Say it, what? So the redundancy principle, Cecile, is a problem because your brain is interpreting two visual components at once, graphics and text. If there are no graphics, there's nothing to be redundant. So it doesn't apply. You mean no graphics as in no written words, or are you saying? No graphics as in no images. So that's what that's what Mayor is focusing on in that chapter is images plus text are two so different So Shaka is forms. saying so Shaka is saying if you're reading something like like a book and you're listening to it at the same time, is that what you're saying, Shaka? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. And I will say I I can clarify what was going on in this conversation, but I have no idea about research. I don't know. I don't know. I feel like that kind of that. still violates the modality principle. Um, does it not? Well, you're right. I see what you're saying because you're not loading the visual. Well, you are. So when you're reading, that's the visual channel and then you're listening, that's the auditory. I see what you're saying. It's tricky. Yeah, that's a good question. Very, very good question. If anybody has any ideas, uh, you know, I know Doc Rio was also in the same program as I was. Uh, you know, let it, let us know what you think. Uh, that is a very good question. That's a tricky one. So I think um, museums are a really interesting um, avenue for this topic too, because you have exhibits that have you know tech you know exhibit labels that have also have images, and you also have the object in front of you. Um, so it'd be really interesting. I think. Um, I'm sure there's research, even if it's, you know, not super prominent <laughs> out there about it, but, um, you know, visitor studies about, you know, in, in the museum world, there has been, there's now definitely levels of, you know, quote unquote, best practices as far as text and images and objects are concerned. Um, so I think teachers or any kind of educator could also take from the museum education world in that respect and that all exhibit labels really should be written at like a fifth grade reading level. Um, and we've steered away from, hopefully, a lot of museums are still stuck in their ways, but um, you know, the long blocks of text in a, an exhibit label really should not be the thing. It should have good color contrast, you know, all these things like Mark had said about dyslexia, you know, what font are you using? that, you know, those considerations and how all of those work in tandem where people still really enjoy their visit and they get something out of it. It may not be everything, but they walk away not overwhelmed, e even though they were offered multiple modes of the information, multiple, you know, ways of receiving it. So just a food for thought. Yeah, I just wanted to add real quickly that um, we're talking a lot about like sort of that bottom up where we're looking at the sensory information and how it comes in. 
but it's important not to forget the top down in terms of how these ideas connect to each other and to their previous knowledge. And then actually that's a lot of times where I try to spend most of my energy and then just sort of get all the other stuff sort of more templated out. Like I have best practices that I use sort of like recipes to make sure that I stay on track with not violating any of these principles, but just, yeah, as a reminder, that top down thing is so important, like the fifth grade reading level, like they don't need to be spending time figuring out what words mean if we can help it. And then short sentences, keeping things active and not passive, all that good stuff. I think really like deciphering what are your learning outcomes, right, Mark? It's kind of like, what do you actually want people to get out of this? If you're, at least in the museum world, are you really wanting them to leave memorizing the the weight and height of the moon lander like it's it, right like or is it an experiential thing is it and i think that speaks to what you said mark as far as top down like what are we trying to get them to know and how do then we have those multiple modes of access and how do we communicate that information get them to know and also get them to feel you yeah, want them exactly. to emotionally yeah. feel something when they go through it yeah empathy is a huge theme in the museum world so just because it's sort of relevant, uh, Space Center announced its rebranding today, and we're focusing on, like the way that we're phrasing it is, our goal, our mission is to bring people in space closer together. And that doesn't mean that we want everybody to know the weight of the last moon lander. It means we want them to feel that they want to be a part of the space exploration journey. And so just feeling can be as important as knowledge, if that's your goal. Um, and just, you know, going back to the principles, um, I feel like a part of that is if we're trying to focus on what are our learning goals, um, we need to understand what is the purpose? What is the meaning behind these principles? What, are, what is he really trying to say? Like he he's giving us practical advice that is not always applicable to everyone, but the ideas behind them, not overextending someone's cognitive load, um, focusing on what really matters because there are principles about that. Um, those, those foundational principles still apply regardless of the learner, regardless of the situation. Um, so I think if we try to approach the, the content, the research from that perspective, it becomes a lot more usable. I'm just going to throw it out there. We have not talked about the the last principle and we spent like 30 minutes on these two. If we want to talk about the last one, maybe now is a good time to switch to that one. Just a thought. And now I'm going to disappear into a smaller seat. Yeah, we probably have about 10 minutes left if we want to cover that one, unless anyone has any thoughts, last minute thoughts. Georgette, do you want to do a quick like one to two minute recap of the last principle we have, which I believe is principle four, right? Is that right? Yeah, sure, Cecile. Okay, so the um, the final if principle- If you wanna move that... on up, thanks. Oh, Sorry. thanks, Shaka. I got you, I got <laughs> the, you. The principle that we'll be talking about next is principle four, which is the spatial contiguity, oh my God, I can't pronounce it, contiguity principle. So this principle states that people learn better when corresponding words and pictures are presented near rather than far from each other uh, on the page or on the screen. So basically what um, this principle is saying is if we're ever going to have images with like their supporting words, uh, that the words and the phrases should be um, right next to them. So for example, what if we're, um, what if we have like a diagram of a plane and we want to like label the different parts of a plane, it would just make sense to put, you know, the tail next or the word tail next to the tail, the word wing next to the wing. So just that spacing between the word and the visual would be what helps, uh, you know, the learner like actually learn. And also then in this way, when the words and the images are close together, uh, learners don't have to use their cognitive resources and like in order to to link like, oh, where does this word belong to which image? Because they would be right next to each other. Oh, 
Awesome. Um, I have a question to kick it off, but Courtney, it, you kind of popped up here. Did you have any initial thoughts? I just, uh, I'm very passionate about the idea of a good image transcript. Um, I think a lot of the times when we talk about spatial contiguity, we're thinking about infographics and diagrams, um, which are often a single image with words as part of the JPEG or whatever, and you can't screen read or a JPEG. So image transcripts, I think, are so important. It, we know about alt text. We know that we can add like a short description of an image, but we can also make a literal transcript that says, you know, description of the spleen, and then it like describes like this points to the spleen or whatever, like it goes through all the things that the diagram is showing um, and putting those visual descriptions of the thing next to the text that would have described it within the transcript applies to that spatial contiguity principle. Yeah, that was my spiel. <laughs> oh, and I have a question for Rachel. Sorry, I didn't realize I wasn't muted earlier. <laughs> um, uh, so only as of recently, I learned about not just creating a video transcript, but also a video transcript with vi um, visual descriptions, so that when you say a certain word, it also describes what scene is happening very, very briefly while that sentence is being said. Uh, so I learned about this really recently from, you know, uh, WCAG, um, but I haven't actually seen anyone do it except WCAG. So I guess the question is, how common is this? Um, you know, how important and valuable is this? And, it, you know, in, have you seen this done in your workplace? Yeah. Um, so it's a great question. <laughs> um, so audio descriptions um, are ever evolving, I think, too, as far as um, um, best practices um, and practicing how you write them too, um, as well as just verbal descriptions. Um, you know, you go to an art museum, is the way that you describe a painting subjective or objective? And is your feelings in it or are your feelings not in it? And, you know, what are the, what are the colorful words that you're using to make it interesting and not interesting or make sure that they know what it looks like, but you're not telling them how to feel about it, right? There's so many things to consider with something like that. Um, and that's an ongoing kind of workshop, you know, um, uh, practice situation. And then audio descriptions, I would say that, um, it's becoming more standard slash expected for, you know, um, films in, again, museums that, that come with an audio description. Um, it depends on where they're sourcing the videos from certain places like here, since we work with NASA, um, there's films that are made in house versus being sourced from outside organizations. And so how you develop those audio descriptions and captioning and um, can can look very different um, and provide its own obstacles. Um, so uh, you may, you know, you may have to send it out to be um, to like a contractor to get your audio descriptions done. Um, a little plug is that um, if you want to watch Crip Camp on Netflix, um, it's a great example of, it's about um, disability and disability advocacy and disability history, especially around the ADA. Um, and uh, my sister worked on it, she's cool. Um, and, <laughs> You know, they since it was done by disabled people for dis, you know for the community for disabled people, um, they have a lot of those things like audio descriptions and you know people like my sister worked on the captions and you know it was all done in house by people that could do it and it, it's a good example of how it can be done. Um, a lot of times you have to request audio descriptions. It's, you know, it's not just offered. So um, I would say it's always something to be considered. I would say standard best practice is that any video has audio description available to use, um, but I know that's not reality, so. Um, and Cecile, um, on I can kind of answer that question from a higher education standpoint. Um, at least at our institution, 
we are trying to make sure that all of our transcripts include visual descriptions. So not the audio caption part, but um, a lot of our videos might be a professor standing in front of a, a set of like slides that are kind of embedded in the video. And they might be like clicking through, like I'm working on a humanities class, they're clicking through images of art and they're describing like, oh, this is a painting by, you know, Leonardo da Vinci, and you'll notice these important characteristics. Um, you'll want to include in the transcript that information that someone might not be seeing that is important to what they're learning. Um, so I know that higher ed, this is something new that we're doing. We haven't been doing this forever. So I know that it's there's definitely a push right now to include visual descriptions in transcripts. Thanks, Courtney. Yeah, we're also starting to do that as well at um, at the university that I work at. Can I just add really fast? I forgot. Um, another uh, mode of uh, another tip or whatever uh, that you want to call it. Um, here at Space Center Houston, all visitors have access to free um, have free access to aria which is a basically a live um live 24 7 service um that uh is for people who are low vision or blind and it's somebody that can you know you pop up on your phone and they describe to you where you are what you're what you what's in front of you how to how to navigate if you need to um so there's also other ways of providing kind of audio descriptions or visual descriptions. Obviously you wouldn't want that necessarily during a show <laughs> potentially, but um, as far as, you know, um, self-guided learning, like I think Courtney was talking about too, like, you know, self-paced learning, um, potentially that gives space for somebody to use an app like Aria and and get their information, their their visual information that way as well. You said space. Because we work at Space Center. <laughs> Puns. Yeah, I just wanted to throw in a tip about um, the proximity of labels on diagrams and infographics, because that's something Meyer, Mayers talks about a little bit. And the um, something that I've learned is looking at eye tracking is really important. So once you start figuring out the visual hierarchy, um, of a composition like an infographic um, or just even a slide it, once you start seeing it um, in action in terms of the the user's eyes will go in and they'll find the focal point and then they'll look around it and once that kind of clicks in your brain it becomes a lot more natural to say oh look the label needs to go here it needs to go you know i think when i started out in this world i would put the label way over here and draw a line over like an exploded diagram and I thought that was, you know, clever, but it actually just means you got more work for the learner to do. So, yeah, doing a visual, understanding visual hierarchy, how it works, um, so that you have one focal point you go to first, um, looking at all the literature about eye tracking, all that stuff, it works. I will also at this point make a plug for making sure you're doing your HTML correctly if you are using and um, if you're doing online learning, um, because you may think that you have put your captions in a place that visually makes sense with spatial contiguity, but you want to make sure that the, the hierarchy of the information in your HTML is also in the correct order so that someone who is using a screen reader and tabbing around the screen will go from label to image or label to alt text more easily yeah <laughs> yeah that, that's a really good one so if you're using word or google docs um you know it's just making sure you have the right heading labels so that uh keyboard navigation works well um awesome so we are about five minutes <laughs> from finishing. So I just wanted to take a moment to thank everyone for being here and for tuning in. We will have a recording of this. Uh, so um, this will be available uh, afterwards. And we can also put a resource, a quick Google Doc resource page um, for, for y'all uh, for some of the theories and different models and resources that we've mentioned. So just stay tuned. We'll get that to you uh, within 24 hours. Just 
Uh, if you don't already, feel free to follow us on our LinkedIn page, subscribe and like the video on YouTube for the algorithm. Had to say it. And you can always check out our uh, website as well at www.elearningdesigners.org. Um, if there are uh, any questions, please feel free to put them in, but I'll let people pop up here for any concluding statements. Um, who still says, Dev I do, I do. Thanks, Shaka. And sorry, it's not that accessible that we haven't read all these little pop-up texts. It's a little bit difficult because YouTube um, live stream has like about a 10 second lag. <laughs> so when I want to put it into the chat, it, it won't make sense um, at the time that you're reading it. So yeah pop up on here so we all can say some concluding statements and your goodbyes. Uh, and I'll start putting uh, some of our um, links in the chat, like to our LinkedIn page. I just want to say that everyone was freaking out about this event and I think it went great. I think we had a lot of good conversation and this is exactly what I wanted. So thank you to our lovely guest speakers. And thank you to our e-learning designers crew. Y'all are awesome. Yeah, this was great. And now I'm leaving the square. I will just add, if anyone has any questions about something practical they want to learn how to do with accessibility, we are happy to write articles. So feel free to leave questions in the chat about something you want to know more about. And we'll see if we can't make videos or articles about that. Uh, thank you guys for coming. Shall I play the outro music for them? Yeah. Although I said upbeat and I feel like <laughs> I feel like it was very not upbeat earlier. <laughs> it was a Taylor Swift song that had had a piano cover. If you know the song, it's very upbeat, but it's still laid back. Upbeat and laid back. It's my it's my sweet spot. I said Beyonce. I said Beyonce. You know what? So. You can run the stream next time. How about that? Uh, that will be scary. I have OBS, but I'm not sure I'm ready for that yet. Uh, but thank y'all all for coming along and we'll have uh, the recording up. We'll post it on our LinkedIn page when it's ready um, and you'll see it here on our channel. So uh, thank you all. And I think that's about it. All right. Uh, Shaka, feel free to cut the stream whenever you're ready.